Hey everybody, welcome back to a brand new episode of the Hemmings Hot Rod Barbecue. On this episode, we have Mr. Dylan McCool. Now, Dylan has been doing YouTube videos for, it's got to be 10, 12 years at this point, I think. He's got over half a million subscribers on his channel. One of the nicest, most honest guys you will ever meet. Um, his, his builds consist of everything from dropping Gen 3 Hemis into 73 or 72 Challengers, basically resurrecting old cars that he finds in fields. But the nice part is everything that he does is just, it's a feel good, uh, feel good show to watch. He is one of the nicest guys. So Dylan, thank you so much for coming on. It's been far too long since I last spoke to you. Well, thank you for having me. It's an honor to, to be invited onto the show. I'm excited to be here. Cool. So how you doing, man? What's been going on? Well, it's it's funny actually. I just took a break from a. Uh, I was working on a big block Monaco. <laughs> I've, been, I've been tearing apart a Chrysler big block, getting it put back together to put back in the cars. So that's where I've been today. You know, just tearing apart rusty cars and trying to put it back together. Okay, so I want to ask because, like I said, if, if for for those listeners out there, um, one Dylan, where can everybody find your stuff? I want to get that out of the way right in the beginning. Where's your YouTube channel, Instagram, Facebook, everything? So I try to make it as simple as possible. It's literally just my name. If you just type in Dylan McCool in YouTube or onto Instagram, uh, that's that's the best way to find me. I have a couple of uh, Facebook pages, uh, like for you know fans who want to join and just like some, share their their cars as well, or just you know any kind of tech tips they can need. It's Dylan McCool on YouTube or the viewer ride in discussion. But mainly, um, easiest way to reach me is on either Instagram at Dylan McCool or my YouTube channel. Okay, very good. So let me ask you something. The builds that you do, the cars that you resurrect, the cars that you find and pull out of fields, um, how did you get into this? Because there are a lot of people out there that are trying to do what you do. A lot of times they don't do it that well. <laughs> I mean, th this is not something we both don't know. A lot of people just aren't that good at it. You, on the other hand, are very good at it. And I think a lot of that has to do with not only your demeanor, but that you really do care about the vehicles that you're saving. And I think that's, you can't fake that. You can't fake the enthusiasm. You can't fake being genuine about it. But the other wonderful part is that you get them to run and you give these vehicles new life. So how did that start, man? How did you get into this? I appreciate that. Um, it also, well, at least for myself and enjoying cars, I mean, I grew up around this stuff. My dad was big time, you know, finding cars in fields and, getting them to, to run and drive. I mean, he, he would buy cars, sell cars. That's what he did. And funny enough, I actually found a picture of his house. Uh, they did like a, a survey, the state did back in like the, the mid eighties. And they've had a picture of where he lived and it was Mopars everywhere. So I don't feel <laughs> as bad, you know, right, seeing right. Cars around the same age, you know, it, it looks about the same, but you know, growing up, he had challengers, chargers, Cudas, just uh, trucks everywhere. And, you know, I couldn't help but not be involved with stuff like that. But, you know, growing up, you know, being around cars, that was just a given. As far as like the video aspect of it, I mean, I can remember being a kid. Like you said, I've, I've had a YouTube channel for a long time. Yeah. I didn't get really serious into it until maybe like 2017, 2018. But yeah. back when I was a kid, you know, every time you look it up something, I remember YouTube was like, what, 05 when it started? Sure. That's right. And, I remember I'd search something about a car because that's all I would do. I got books over here full of just like specifications to different muscle cars and all sorts of stuff. And, you know, if you if you looked up like a Challenger or a Cuda in like a Google search, all of a sudden you see videos pop up everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, man, this is kind of cool. You can see videos that other people are posting. So I like to draw and I, I started I wanted to post a, a video of my pictures that I drew. So I did that and I thought you know, I'm working on these cars with my dad. It's kind of cool. Let's just kind of document that. Yeah. Well, that moved into, let's just video these adventures that we go on. Like the first really major hit that I had was a, uh, it was a Dodge Warlock that he went and bought. And I was just tagging along and said, do you care if I video it? He says, no, not at all. So I brought my little GoPro out there out in the middle of a cow pasture, just walking around this Warlock and, and people just, they loved it. They loved the video. And I realized that, you know, it's something we were doing already it's just right. uh, it just so happens that you know i loved videos i love film i love watching movies and i was like let's just combine the two together my passion is for cars and passion for videos and it just kind of went from there so when did you realize because the first if, if people go to your youtube channel you'll see videos for from 
you know, 10, 12, 13 years ago. And the videos are, they're short. They're basically just, just walk around. Sometimes there's no verbiage. You don't talk in them, whatever the case is, right? And then little by little, your personality starts to come into the video. Little by little, you start to speak. Little by little, you start to go over the cards. Little by little, you get him. And then all of a sudden, one day, your face shows up. And everybody's like, holy <laughs> cow. You're like, he's a real person. He's not just hands with a camera. So how was that? Because I know it's very interesting as somebody who does video. What was it like to first see yourself in front of the camera as opposed to behind the camera? And how did you feel about that? I uh, probably hated it. I was not a fan of being, <laughs> I hated being in front of the camera for a while there. I mean, it took me, it took me a long time to, to get used to being able to point a camera at me and talk. Mm. And you know, I realized, Hey, you know, I, I don't really talk that loud. So I had to, had to really get some vibrato there, you know, just really speak up. Mm-hmm. And it was hard. It was really tough at first. And then especially, you know, my parents have been like my biggest supporters through all this. They love it. Yeah. Yeah. And when they would watch the videos, I'd leave. I couldn't watch it with them. You know, I, I couldn't stand <laughs> to see myself. But as time went on, it got easier and it kind of got to the where I've told people, like so many people this, that and I'd be working in the shop by myself. And it turns out that my best friend ended up being a camera because I talked to it more than I do anybody else. But mm-hmm. it did take time. I mean, you could tell early, early in the videos, I would uh I'd point the camera away from me. I didn't want to really be in them. Right now it's like, I've realized that people enjoy seeing me and seeing like making a connection. It makes it easier for people to, to see somebody explain something to them and, and have a, like a a connection with them. Yeah. And I think that one, I think that's a very important thing. I think that a lot of people that go out and they do YouTube, they try to have some kind of shtick or some kind of gimmick and they're very loud. They're, you know, they kind of, they're not genuine. And I think the fact that you're, because you are very mild mannered and just very easy. And I think there's something extremely genuine about that, where you're just talking about what you're doing, how you're doing it, why you're doing it. You're never trying to impress, right? You're never trying to do, um, to kind of go out and kind of be somebody you're not. And there's an authenticity there that is very rare with YouTube people. And I think that you know, not seeing your face in front of the camera. I, you know, I get it. It was hard for you at first, Mm -hmm. but now think about how many people have graduated, you know, you know, graduated to your channel, gravitated to it. And you got over half a million subscribers, Mount. That says something. Right. Right. Absolutely. And I mean, I've always tried to just tell people that I'm a normal person, just like anybody else. It just so happens that I can use a camera. You know, that's, Mm -hmm. that's the only difference between that and, and somebody working in their garage on the weekends. Cause I do this Mm -hmm. exact same thing. I mean, I working in a, a garage just with enough room to fit one car and, you know, work in that. But it's something that I've really tried to drive home that anybody can do what I'm doing right now. There's nothing mm-hmm. special about me doing it. It just so happens that you're watching the video about it. But I mean, anybody can drag a car out of the field and, and try to get it to run. Anybody can drop a battery and see what works and what doesn't, you know, it's, it's nothing too crazy or outside of the realm especially with anybody wanting to start a project you know you get so many people say what's the best starter project to to get going and I'm like you know one it just depends on your budget but get out there and just try I mean there's so much stuff you can look on YouTube and Google and but until you actually do it yourself but again that's that's just what doesn't it doesn't differentiate me at all it just so happens that I post a video about what I'm doing right anybody can do what I'm doing and I want to kind of push that and, and tell people that they can get out there and make something happen. Yeah. And I, and I think you're absolutely right. I think one of the things that people also don't understand is that if you're trying to, to post videos and if you are posting them, you can't get discouraged. And I think that that happens to a lot of people. I know that when I first started, I got called every name in the book. And I mean, <laughs> yep. you know, if, if you are, if you're going to put yourself out there, right. J- aside from your boy voice, but you put your face out there, People are going to comment on it. They are going to tell you that you stink, that you're terrible, that you're the worst, that you don't know anything. They will come at you six ways from Sunday and they they are relentless. However, what I find is that if you keep doing it and you're consistent and you are, you just stay true to whatever your mission is, right? Whether that's, you know, kind of restoring cars or fixing cars or just literally just talking about them and being enthusiastic about it. There are people out there that are going to, to jump on that bandwagon. 
and they're going to stick with you. And then what you find is that audience all of a sudden now is defending you when somebody comes on and says, well, he's, he doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. All of a sudden now, 15 people are going to be like, what are you talking about? This guy's awesome. He's been doing this for years. Look at this stuff. And I think that's, that's one of the biggest hurdles that most people have to overcome. Right. They just have to get to that point to do it. Right. Yeah. And I mean, even with like, even if you're not doing videos, just the car culture in general, man, like, I've had so many people, even before I started YouTube, is like, you can't do that or you shouldn't do that. And I know that, like, as a fellow Mopar guy, uh, you know that the Mopar guys are a little bit different. Yeah, they're the, dude, they're the worst. Straight up. <laughs> I will say it. You don't have to say it. I will say it. Mopar guys are the worst. We know this. We're just, we're weird. We're, we're weird folks. But if you're just strictly that, I mean, yeah, there, there's some weird folks everywhere. But, like, some people don't realize that there's a different way to do everything you want to do. I mean, there's, you Correct. can, you can approach a different kind of build or whatever. And those negative comments, man, they, they kind of made me want to do it more. Like you saw my challenger at, at mm -hmm. Mo party Great. and it has a, it has a giant dent in the driver's side door. That's right. And I had I, thousands of comments <laughs> mad that I left right. the door like it was, and I didn't paint the car. Right. And, the more comments I got about fixing the door, the more it made me not want to fix the door. Of course it did. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I mean, people are going to try and discourage you no matter what. Man, if I, if I had a, a nickel for every single negative comment I got, man, I'd, I'd be, you know, living the dream. But 99% right. of the comments that you receive on this social media is typically positive. I mean, mm -hmm. at least for the, the things that I've seen, but it's always that one, if you let it, if you allow that one to get to bother you, then That's it right. will. But I mean, if you think about, uh, think about like being able to take that car somewhere and people seeing it and you get ideas and you get to see kind of like a, a way that to do something differently. It's like, Oh, I never thought about it that way. Or I never thought about it this way. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I think the car culture in general is kind of an expression of yourself and people need to realize that, Hey, you know, it's, it's okay to, to not do numbers matching sometimes it's oh, a, yeah. I mean, challenger was a 318 two barrel i mean right why, why would i mess with that right Maybe yeah speed's cool you know but right i and i get everybody has their own thing and their own deal but you, you got to have a little respect for just about every kind of walk of life in, in the car you, culture you you do and i think that that's that that's very very true i mean you know um a lot of the things that any, anytime you modify, anytime you build, anytime you stray from the norm, so to speak, people are going to come down on you. And that's OK. Right. Um, but it's also good because it starts a conversation because, it, you know, my dad told me years ago, if you think it's cool, somebody else is going to think it's cool. And that, that's a that's a very true statement. And so, I've, you know, everything that I've done, I've just I like what I like the same way that you like what you like. Mm -hmm. Other people don't have to agree with it. Right. But as opposed to condemning it, what they really need to do is ask you why you like it. Why, why did you do it as a, you know, why did you do it this way? Why do you right. like it like that? What are the pros to it? What are the cons to it? And then let them make up their own mind after that. But, you know, for those that are listening, don't just condemn, make a point, right. do a little research and ask somebody why they actually built the car like that or, or did that modification like that. You might learn something, you know? Um, well, let me ask you this. So Mopars, right? Like you said, I'm, I'm somewhat of a Mopar guy, but I, I have a little bit of everything in the garage, right? Um, the Mopar stuff in the last 15 years has gone bananas, right? Yeah. Cars right now, cars 15 years ago that were five grand are now 50 grand, yes. right? Cars that were 50 grand five years ago are now 200 grand. Mm -hmm. Why? What do you, what do you, what do you think that is? Everybody's got their opinion and it's, it's Mopar specifically, right? Yes. There are some Chevys out there and some Fords and some AMXs and AMCs out there that bring big money. But I feel like the Mopars, for some reason, have just gone, you know, they fit the stratosphere. Especially the 68 to 70 Charger. Mm -hmm. And you you know just as much as I do. I mean, it's hard to beat the late 60s, early 70s B-body. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, when I bought, I bought a 69 Charger, the first one I got back in 2018. And the price I paid for it then, it's doubled that from right. just in that short span of time. I mean, I guess just these guys pulling these baskets case out of the weeds and just like, hey, this is what I'm going to ask for it. And then they get it. They get the, it's you know, shocking. People pay it. They do. And I'm like, what 
what does that mean that if my car if i paid less than that and my car was a running example what does that say that yeah. my car's worth now i mean i think it's just the the scarcity of it i mean they're they're still out there but the hype centered around i mean you have movies and tv that love to just use that body style charger yeah and like for example for me i mean i grew up see what fast and furious came out in what 2001 2001 yep. so i was what five years old at the time oh my god you killed me. <laughs> so oh. But I grew up with that. And I, whenever yeah. they do the, you know, he does the burnout, the, the wheelie, sure. at the end of their last race, that stuck with me, though. And yeah. I think that there's a generation growing up that they see all these movies and television that has a 69 to 60, 68 to 70 charger just being thrown around. And now that kind of bleeds off to, you know, your challengers, your CUDAs. I mean, like, for instance, like the the Hemi convertible 71 Cudas that, that are going for like multi-millions of dollars. Yeah. That means that, you know, Uncle Joe over here, he's got a, you know, 74 six-cylinder Cuda that he's going to ask. Right. You know, <laughs> a couple, you know, 20, 30,000 just because it, it, it sold just like that one on Barrett Jackson did. So sure. I think that that's well, some of it at least. Well, okay. So interesting. You, you, you brought up like Fast and Furious, right? Cause that's 2001. Now, you know, we always talk about kids getting into the hobby, right? Now, I'm I'm almost 50, right? So I'm, I got you. Well, I'm, I'm double your age for the most part, right? So if, for me, I grew up watching things like Bullet, like the Dukes mm -hmm. of Hazzard, um, you know, Cannonball, all those movies where Dodge Chargers were just, when I first started looking, Dodge Chargers were just old cars. Right. And you and you have this through the generations. Right. When you when I was looking for a charger back in the early 2000s, everybody was like, man, I used to pay three thousand dollars for those cars. And, you know, heavy four speed for three thousand. Well, those days were gone. Now I look at what I paid back in, you know, the early 2000s for both my cars, for the Charger and the Daytona. And I'm like, oh my God, I got the biggest bargain in the world right. because nobody knew. But do you think guys that are younger than you and I'm talking kids, 14, 15 into their early 20s? Do you think the ho the hobby, not just the Mopar cars, but the hobby in general with the muscle cars and the old classics is solid? Do you think that they're interested in? Do you get comments being one of the younger guys on YouTube whereby, you know, a lot of kids are, are looking to you to say, all right, what do I buy? How to get into this? Yeah. Um, I mean, like I said earlier, there's so many comments that I get about what's a good first project and you know, I wish that everybody could go out and have their own charger, but unfortunately that's not the case, but you know, I, I genuinely believe that there are kids. Out. I mean, I, I've, I even had a, I had a kid write me a letter from his school. He was, I think he was 12 or 13 years old, just wrote me a letter just to talk about how he watched my channel and how he wanted to have a car. And I'm like, that there, you, you don't, yeah, you don't realize the best. There, there are people who watch you and I mean, I have some, you know, li real little cousins that they just, even one of them, you know, now it's, it's weird to me, but they have like Snapchat and they can text me and I'm like, you're supposed to be still, you know, a child, <laughs> but they're like eight, nine, 10 years old. And he messaged me just the other day. He says, Hey, I want to come over and work on a car with you. Yeah. So I, I do believe that there is still somewhat of a hope. I mean, I think that this also goes for the argument that four doors are no longer parts cars. I think that, no. <laughs> that, no. that that's where we're going, you know, and I've got to where like, I really appreciate the parts cars because they're cheap or the four door cars. They're, they're really cheap. They're easy to get into. And yeah. It's getting to the point where, you know, I used to recommend a duster or a dart to somebody, but now that's yeah. starting to get crazy, but that's right. I think there's still a market for it. I think that there's still kids growing up that see, they'll see like, you know, somebody like you and me driving around in an old charger and it, yeah. and it sticks with them and correct. it, it just, it, it hangs on and they think, man, I, I wish I could do that one day. And sure enough that it, it happens. It can happen. Yeah. And I, and I agree with you. I mean, the whole four door thing, they were kind of ostracized for quite some time. And now, and I look, I probably look, I say this all the time. I probably look at three to 500 cars a day minimum, right? That's how I spend my evenings. I sit on the couch, you know, after dinner, and that's how I wind down. I do it right. every single website out there, and I go to, okay, what am I snagging? <laughs> and my, make no mistake, every time I go to look for a car, regardless of what it is, 
I go on these websites to buy, not to look. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the reason that I do that is because I really, truly think that as an enthusiast, you shouldn't, you shouldn't limit yourself. And if you can do it, you should try to experience as many cars as you can. And I'm not looking for big dollar cars. I'm not looking for $60,000 cars. I'm looking for $4,000 cars. Right. I'm looking for $7,000 cars. I'm looking for sub $10,000 cars that I can get into, I can play with, and I can experience them. And it doesn't mean that I'm going to keep them forever. It just means I put another experience into my, you know, on, under my belt. And I can say, yeah, I had one of those. It was a great right. car or it wasn't a great car, but I got to enjoy it. And I think the four-door market is such that you can still do it. You can still get into a clean four door for a you know reasonable money. And people seem to forget like a four door Chevelle is still a Chevelle. It is. A four door satellite is still a Mopar Bebot, right. right? You know, like a four door Dart is still a Dart. Mm -hmm. It's like that's okay. All those parts still fit. Right? right, and you can put your friends in the back. Like I don't see the <laughs> exactly. <problem. laughs> Everybody can go right around. Yeah, it's it's. And I think that also kind of goes hand in hand with the mentality that you have to have a pristine example of whatever car you're working on. Mm -hmm. And I get it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I'd love to have a beautiful car of every example I have, but sometimes you can't. Sometimes That's it's right. like, hey, I'm working on a budget. Let me go work on this, you know, four door dart or whatever. And it's got a decent paint job on it. And you know, I'm going to drop a 318 in it because that's mm -hmm. what's within my realm. And I can go have fun with it right now. I can go do something with it and enjoy it. I mean, yeah. like, for instance, one of my, my cars that I have enjoyed more than just about anything is a Mustang 2. And oh, I, I watched cars. the video on it, dude. It's great. Of all cars. Like, it's I a know, great little thing. I grew up being told that the Mustang 2 was the abomination of right. the Mustang world. But after doing that, I've grown to appreciate that car. And I've had thousands of comments of people saying that they love those cars too mm -hmm. so i mean there's there's a, a seat for everybody basically there's, right. there's always somewhere for you to get into wherever it may be take your car down to the local cruise in there's going to be somebody and i guarantee it's somebody out there who's going to love the exact same. like you said there's if you think it's cool somebody else thinks it's cool but just show it off have fun with it, it doesn't have yeah. to be perfect there's always going to be somebody who's got a faster car than you there's, it doesn't matter, but you can always have fun and just, you know, enjoy what you have. You don't have to compare yeah. yourself to what everybody else is doing. Just have a good time. Well, that, that's very true. So, okay, now I, I want to pivot. I want to talk about the experience, right? Because I know when I first got into the business, the only reason I have a career is a, it, it, I was just too naive not to know that I shouldn't drive my charger every place, right? <laughs> And it's, I, you know, I just, I looked at them as simple. It was a car. It was a car. Right. Car has four wheels and a motor, which means it gets me from point A to point B. So I would literally get my charger. And I remember when I got it, you could eat off it. I mean, we rebuilt the call car. It was flawless. It is not flawless now, right? It is. It's got dings in it. It is pockmarked up. Like things don't work. But, but I would get in that car and I would drive it any place at any time. Right. Right. And the reason it has all the chips and the dings and the this and the oil, whatever the case is, is because it's been driven. It's because of the experiences. And you are a big proponent of that. You, you know, if, if people are out there, you got to go to Dillard's Challenge, you got to watch his road trip videos. Anybody who's ever jumped in a 40 or 50 or 60 year old car knows that something most likely is going to go south if you drive these cars, right? It's not a, it's not a case of if, it's a case of when, Right. And I think the, the biggest hurdle is actually doing that and saying, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw some tools in the truck. I'm going to go. And if something happens, well, I'll deal with it when it happens, right? What do you think? I, yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of just, you know, flying by the seat of your pants and just seeing if it'll make it somewhere. Like just talking about that Mustang too. I mean, that car sat for 25 years, I believe. Uh, got it to run, did the brakes, put a gas tank in it, drove it around the block. It was about a four mile loop and immediately drove two hours and took a drag racing. That's awesome. And, then, and drove it back. It didn't make it all the way home, but it made it close enough to where I counted it as a win. And it didn't blow up, <laughs> thankfully. But yeah, I mean, like I said, you, you can have a lot of fun with an old car because, you know, usually I, I packed the trunk full of just tools that I thought I might need. Mm -hmm. And yeah. you can get just about anywhere. I mean, 
I do, you know, taking like a trip like Power Tour, for instance, you know, took yeah. my Challenger on that one, and which it was a little bit easier with that modern Hemi, but take it out there and, and use it for what it is, because, you know, like you said, it's a car, and that's what it's meant to be done. With. You know, you, you take it and you drive mm -hmm. it. I grew up riding in, you know, I, it's funny talking about a 68 Charger. Dad had one that was an immaculate original example it was a metallic blue big block um had blue interior i believe uh bucket seat console car it was non it was it wasn't an rt or anything but good run and driving examples had the original yeah. belts and hoses on it and this was probably <laughs> early 2000s he would yeah. drive he'd take me to ball practice in that car yeah. we would get there and i remember smoke rolling out of the hood because it had gotten hot right. and he, just, <laughs> he just laughs he thought it was yeah. funny and he's yeah. like, it'll be fine. We'll make it back home. Yeah. I, and I grew up around that seeing, you know, challengers and chargers be driven like they were supposed to be. So yeah. it kind of rubbed off on me to, you know, take a car and, and use it for what it's intended to do. And that's to be driven. Well, I think, and it also comes down to the experience, right? Like when your dad dropped you off and steam was coming out from under the hood, he knew exactly what it was. Yeah. Right. And so, and I think the more, the more adventures you have in an older vehicle, the more it kind of puts your mind at ease, the more you go, you see the temp gauge rising and you go, ah, okay, I'll make it. I know when to shut it off. Yeah. If I know you, my threshold you, there. I know my threshold. <laughs> if you hear it pinging, you're like, oh, I probably got some bad gas. I got to, you know, retard the timing a little bit. Uh, if, if you get used to going, ah, okay, something's probably going to happen. And it's, it's a very interesting thing because if you've never been in that situation and You've never, because new cars right now, you could get in and turn the key, you drive for 150,000 miles, they're not going to blink. It's just what yeah. they do. That's that's evolution. That's that's advancement. That's what that's technology. And it's wonderful. Don't get me wrong. It's fantastic. But you, I kind of miss the uh, the little win factors with that, right? So like, you know, in, in early 2020, when the pandemic first hit, I, I bought a Trans Am. I bought a 79 Trans Am in Dallas, Texas. And I called a buddy of mine that lived in Dallas. And I was like, why don't we just drive it back to San Francisco? He's like, yeah, man. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we literally, we, we got the car and we drove it home. And like, we were like, all right, well, what's going to fail? Cause we knew something was going to fail. Right. And we were like, let's buy a fuel pump. Cause we know that's probably going to take a dump. We're like, let's buy an alternator. Cause that's probably going to take a dump. Right. So everything we thought was going to fail pretty much failed. And then a the couple of other things that, that we didn't realize, that, you know, like we had, you know, two of the plug wires arc through and stuff like that so it's like but you don't worry about that and the more experience you have the more knowledge you gain to fix those things on the side of the road and it's not i don't know for some reason that doesn't bother me like if one of my old cars breaks i'm like ah, that's fine whereas if i'm on a new car it breaks i get straight pissed off right yeah because you'd expect it to to at least make it to where you're supposed to go because like you said of technology advancing but i mean I've been trained, like just it's hardwired into my brain that if you are driving an old car, while you're going down the road, you're always looking for somewhere to pull off just in case Correct. that thing breaks down. That's right. And it's worked. But in the, and it also kind of keeps you, you know, with a level head. It doesn't get you like freaking out, panicking. Right. If you if you just know, hey, so if this thing shuts off, hit the ditch, you know, get off the road out of the mm -hmm. way of everybody else. You know, it's going to be OK. Like I drove a. I don't know why I did this. This was a wild one, but <laughs> bought a, a Pinto station wagon up in Indianapolis, which is like, which is actually North of Indianapolis. It was a, it was about 500 miles from home. Me and right. my buddy were up there for an event. It was, it was on a whim. We just said, Hey, let's see if we can just find something, anything yeah. to drive home. And I found this little Pinto station wagon and <laughs> it didn't have any rear shocks. It had blocks of wood <laughs> holding up the back end. Oh God. And, he said, are you sure about this? And I said, <laughs> no, I'm really not. Yeah. But, but we it. did it anyway. And sure enough, I drove that car. I, I put a, I went to Walmart and bought a water cooler because the gas tank was bad. Ran an electric mm -hmm. pump from the back hatch through the back window up to the, uh, the carburetor, you know, and, and made my own gas tank in the back seat of the car and drove that car 500 miles home, no suspension in the back. And I'll tell you, running through Louisville, Kentucky, about it was about over. Uh, I think yeah, I still right. feel some things about that one. The road <laughs> through there, I mean, my my uh, since there was no rear suspension, my head touched the ceiling a couple times. It hit the mm -hmm. roof a few times. But again, like you said, that car made it home. And yeah, 
it's all about I wasn't I wasn't worried. I said if it if it doesn't make it home, it's gonna get home. We're gonna figure out right. how to fix it. That experience right. that you get from, you know, you drive a little bit further. You take that car you've been working on, drive it around the block. Okay, drive to the store. Okay, mm-hmm. drive it to you know a car show. Okay, mm-hmm. drive to the car show that's two hours away, four hours away. Then you get right. comfortable and you learn how to how to deal with certain situations and it puts you in uncomfortable situations, but you learn how to overcome it. Right. Well, I, I really believe that old cars are kind of a blueprint for getting through life to an extent, right? Because one of the things that I, that they've taught me is to relax a little bit, to not be stressed, to, there are times when everybody's going to be stressed. In an old car, it brings your anxiety level down. Where a lot of people think it brings your anxiety level up, old cars teach you to relax because mm-hmm. you don't have a choice. They teach you that, <laughs> that be, right? You don't have a choice. They you teach don't. you that. Not everything is in your control. They teach you to be prepared for anything because most of the time something's going to happen, right? And you have to be prepared for it. They teach you how to kind of think on the fly, to make quick decisions, to do all these things. And like, I feel like if everybody, everybody who's listening to this, that grew up in like the fifties, the sixties, the seventies, the eighties, they were like, dude, you're not telling us anything we don't know. Right. Right. (laughs) But for anybody that was born at, you know, in the late seventies, eighties, nineties, I'm telling you right now, driving an old car with a carburetor, with points, right? You know, will teach you so much about just making your way through life in general. I feel like at this point, everybody should just buy an old car for their first car to just kind of break themselves into life. I don't know if that makes any sense, but I know it's helped me, right? Well, because you you got to figure it out. It's either you stay here or, and nothing's going to happen or you fix it. And you keep going. That's, that's, that's right. the biggest thing. So that's exactly just like, right. It's like an old car. If, if you want to make it somewhere, you got to figure it out. Right. Okay. So let me ask you this. So now your old challenger, right? Like you said, big dent in the door, 318, two barrel car. You put a five, seven Hemi in it. You put a gen three Hemi in the car, which is, which is great. Listen, my Daytona, I'm putting a, you know, a red eye motor in that thing. Um, you have a lot of people that are against the, you know, resto mods and putting, you know, new motors in it and adding fuel injection and stuff like that. And I get that. Um, but in the same token, how much more enjoyable was that to do? And did you find that any different than putting, I don't know, an old big block in it from an experience standpoint, right? Was it, was the satisfaction the same? Oh man, it was, it, I mean, cause I, I did the exact same thing with that five, seven that I would have done, you know, if I put a small block or a big block in it, I went through everything. I checked everything, made sure, I mean, it was a good low mile engine, but as far as like having something, I mean, I could have that as a daily driver if I wanted to, Mm -hmm. it got like 22, 23 miles to the gallon for per gallon. And with three ninety ones in in the rear and it's really (laughs) short tire, lay an absolute patch down the road, but get 22, 23 miles per gallon. But as far as like, I mean, it still has its old car squeaks, vibrations and things sure. about it, but swapping a Hemi was so much fun. And I've, you know, I've grown up working with only carburetors and distributors. So I was terrified mm-hmm. when I first yeah. did that. Good set of conversion mounts, drop it in with the Holly harness and it fired right up. I mean, turn the key and it was done. It was, it was easy. And, but now that I've done that, I could go work on it and still feel confident to to figure out and diagnose an issue with this modern Hemi you know before mm-hmm. then I didn't know a thing about him I had no clue how any of it worked all I saw was like a giant spaghetti of wiring harness and all sorts of sensors and, and things that I, I had no idea what they meant mm-hmm. but now I felt like you know that that experience of doing this taught me a whole lot about learning for the future as well you know because you know like it or not I mean the, the gas engine, of course, is going to fade away. But, sure. I mean, fuel injection has been around for what? 50 decades. years, 60 years. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, way back in the, you know, like, I have a 71 Volkswagen with fuel injection on it. Like, what the heck is this? I don't know how it works, but I'm going to figure right. it out. Right. But that's what's cool. I mean, just, you know, people were kind of naysayers about it. But the majority of people, when you pop the hood on that car, and you see a brand, the car looks like garbage on the outside. And I love it. You mm-hmm. pop the hood on that thing. The hood's, you know, rust is falling out of it. The hood's bent in the middle. You pick <laughs> that thing up and you see a 5.7 Hemi in there. 
and a four speed pistol grip inside the car. I mean, it's, it's got a wow factor to it. That's yeah. it, it never gets old. Yeah. I, I totally agree with that. And it, it was very interesting. You know, uh, Dylan and I had both attended a Holly event last year called Mo party, right? And it, obviously Mopar centric event. What I wasn't expecting was to see, I don't know. What do you think? 40% at least gen three Hemi swaps. You think it was that much? I would say, yeah, there was a, a good chunk of cars there with the Gen 3 Hemi. Right. And I think that five years ago, one, you never would have seen that, right? You, you, because back then, one, Gen 3 Hemi swaps were, nobody was really doing them. It was LS swaps and, and you know, fuel injected, you know, TBI conversions and stuff like that, more on the Chevy side. Um, and now you're seeing you know, not only Coyote swaps and Fords, but Gen 3 Hemi swaps and continued LS swaps and stuff like that. But people are starting to realize that, yeah, this technology is okay. Like it works. It works in your new car. It'll work in your old car. But I think one of the things it does, and like you just said, you could use your Challenger as a daily driver if you wanted to, right? right. Starts right up every time, goes down the road just fine, gets 22 right. miles to the gallon. That's fantastic. So like why, unless you're like a diehard numbers matching guy, why wouldn't you want, like, I want that. I think that's great. You know, I, I think it's the, again, like, like for my example too, it's, it's the fear of that, at least of not knowing how to maybe work on it because again, carburetors and distributors, you know, it, it's simple. It's super simple. You could bypass just about everything, you know, 12 volts from the battery to the coil and that thing will fire up. That, that's right. easy. <laughs> I, I think that's, and again, I, I still love, you know, old carburetor push rod V8s, nothing against those at all. But whenever you get to something that you want to use, even if it's just like a, a throttle body, you know, just an yeah. aftermarket throttle body, just to drive it and be able to to do something like a daily driver, it just makes things pretty easy. easy. It makes it easy. Right. And you can still enjoy the same exact car. Right. That's exactly correct. So let me ask you now, what are you what are you doing now? Obviously, you're still doing videos. What builds do you have on the on the horizon? And you know, for you've been in this long enough that you've seen kind of the YouTube space change, um, and it, it it is constantly evolving as well. Where do you see kind of the media side of this thing going? Do you like have you changed your course at all? Are you staying kind of true to where you are? Like, what, what what's next for you? Well, um, well, as far as current projects, uh, like I told you earlier, working on a, a 65 Monaco, getting it back, sat for like 40 plus years in the, mm. in the woods, drug it out. Um, uh, my 69 Charger, going to go back through it and fix some things. Got a few trucks and I have, a, of all things, a 55 or 6 Cadillac. I don't know how I ended up with that, Ooh. but I'm going to do something with it. Got T-Bone, but it's a complete V8 car. Beautiful. Has even has right. like the, the air conditioning in the trunk and all that. It's wow. It's got some good stuff on it, but it's it's rough. But um, as far as like the way that I see YouTube going now, um, three, four, five years ago, doing what I do now or as far as like finding an old car will it run that stuff few and far between I mean mm -hmm. I started like dragging the the cars out of the field and doing videos on them like back in like 2015 that was like mm -hmm. the first one I ever did and then it evolved from will it run will it drive will it do this will it do that now everybody's doing it so now it's kind of like right. what is the what's the next thing in line so I still do some of that stuff, but instead of just like what you see a lot of the time happen is, will it run? Okay. It runs now. Now we're just going to park it back here and never touch it again. Right. And then it just right. never, it, it's like, it never even happened. I like to try, I'm trying to do now is will it run? Okay. It runs. Can we make it drive? Okay. Can we use this and make it a dependable car once more? Mm -hmm. And sure. I, I want it to be, it may not be the perfect example of whatever that car is. It may not, it may have to be rusty. It may have some dents in the door again, but, it, but it's a driver. It's something that, you know, if I did sell it to somebody, they could turn the key and drive off in it. So as far as that, I, I just want it to be, at least for my small market that I have market share here, I want it to be where people can, again, just inspire somebody to, to do something and to, and to enjoy it. So yeah, YouTube's always changing. I think that it's it's to the point where, you know, everybody again, you know, they're starting to see, hey, I can do this. I can mm -hmm. make a YouTube channel. But you type in will it run, you'll get a million different channels doing the exact same thing. So it's it's a little right. bit tougher now to kind of 
forge a path through that. But being that I've done it for so long, people realize, hey, this is kind of what Dylan does. Yeah, but that's exactly correct. Well, let me ask you. So how many cars do you currently have? Do you even oh. know? <laughs> <laughs> I have a list. I have a, a running list. I mean, gosh, I want to say I know it's over 20, maybe 25, 30. But and people like, yeah, you must be rich. You must be all this money. Yeah, right. no, no. <laughs> it's all like five hundred thousand dollars. Right, right. <laughs> garbage, garbage cars. I mean, like, right. I have a, I bought a '66 Ford Custom. It's an old Tennessee State Trooper car, big block, four twenty eight. Was buried in the weeds. Yeah, and it was like eight hundred bucks. Okay. Yeah, dude, cool. you drag some stuff out of the woods that I'm like, there is no way this thing's gonna move again. Right. It is it's, shocking, shocking what you drink out, <laughs> out of the woods. But that's what's fun. It's it's the challenge of it all. It's like you said, the experience, man. But all this stuff that I work on, I mean, you know, you just happen like that. That Cobra was five hundred dollars. Right. It was just people think, how do you find this stuff? Well, that car was literally one day it wasn't there, and the next day it was sitting in somebody's driveway, just a quarter mile down the road. Yeah, I drove by and said, oh. That wasn't there yesterday. I turned right. around and asked him how much you how much you want for it. Five hundred bucks. I said, okay, I'll buy it. Right. Simple as that. I mean, Done. right. I, you know, you keep your head on a swivel when you're driving down anywhere, anywhere. You're always right. looking. Where's that in that back lot or somebody's backyard? There's a car here, a car there, and that's how I found a lot of vehicles that you, that I mean, I work on. So yeah, it's it's kind of gotten out of hand some of the collection, but you know, it's <laughs> it's pretty fun. Well, that's good, man, because, you know, it's interesting. I mean, being located in the Midwest, you have that out here. We just don't one. We, nobody's got any land around here. Right. So you can't store anything um, Two, you know, the cars that are around here are everybody wants nine billion dollars for them, regardless of the shape that <laughs> yeah. they're in, which is difficult. Um, and that's the same on the East Coast as well. Like when I was growing up in the boroughs, um, cars were hidden. They were in the backs of garages and stuff. And you you physically couldn't see them because they were either in gates or in garages and stuff like that. So it's cool what you do, because the fact is it gives people that are located in, in kind of metropolitan areas hope that, yes, these cars are still out there. Yes, if you take it like that's one of my favorite parts about taking a road trip is getting off the interstate, going on back roads and seeing what's around. And like, I'm not afraid to walk up to somebody's door and just knock on it and just be like, what's going on here? I, I'd really like to, you know, see what's what. And that doesn't happen too often, but that's why you have to get out and why you have to drive these cars because it does make a difference. So I think what you're doing is fantastic. I think that your channel is a constant inspiration to people that are um, wanting to get into the hobby and it doesn't matter if they're 10 years old or they're 80 years old, right? It's, it's showcasing that, listen, I did it. You can do it too. It's not rocket science. You just have to say, I want to do it, Right. right. You know, and the other thing I, I think it's important is that it's okay if you fail at a project. There's nothing wrong with that. And I, oh, you know, man. people like <laughs> right, I, right. As many times as I've failed a project, good lord, I tell you, there's you know, you drop, you put an engine together, wipe a cam lobe. Okay, well, you know, what do you do? Trash the whole car? No, you tear it back down and put another one in it. So That's yeah, right. it happens. That's right. All right. Well, we've been on for almost an hour now, so we're going to close it out. But if you had to give advice. To anyone out there that wants to get into this hobby, that is stuck mid-build, that's losing enthusiasm, what would you tell them? Get it going. Run it, drive it, wear it down, fix it later. That's the biggest thing, man. Get it out of the garage. You know, do what you got to do to fit back together. And I've seen people like say, I've had my car sitting in my shop for 20 years working on paintwork. Why? What's, right. what's, what good is it doing sitting in there? Put it right. together, get it out, drive it, enjoy it. As far as somebody wanting to get in the hobby, search every, like you said, search every space that you can that sells a vehicle. Go out, take a take a road trip. Go within like, you know, a little bit out of your your little area, your zone there, and mm -hmm. just look. Find that car. Don't be afraid to go and ask somebody if they'd be willing to sell something or get to know people. You know, I still have relationships just from buying a vehicle from somebody that I bought years ago. Don't be afraid to get out there and enjoy something, and and but get out there and do it, you know. It's, it's one thing to say you're wanting to do it, but actually going out there and do it is a different thing. Just take that step and, and go out there and learn and enjoy it. There you go. So for everybody out there that's listening, listen to what Dylan has to say, because he's actually quite good at it. And um, 
if you haven't already, go to his YouTube channel, his Instagram page, follow and subscribe to both because not only is it unbelievably entertaining, but you might just learn something. And that's kind of what we try to make people do is learn something and provide them with entertainment. So Dylan, thank you so much for coming on the podcast, man. It is always great to talk to you. Um, and dude, anytime that you want to come back on, just call me up and be like, let's, let's bullshit about cars for another hour. Hey, and it, I will it, say, I will say, okay. <laughs> you do not have to, to beg me or anything. I will gladly do it. I, I, I love to talk cars, man. That's, that's live, eat, sleep, all that stuff. So, but thank you for having me. It's been awesome. It's, it's really been a pleasure. And of course, always to talk with you again, man. So if you're ever out this way, you know, out in Tennessee, let me know. I'd love to show you around the place, show you some of these junk cars. <laughs> uh, dude, I I think we're going to be out there in, a, in probably three or four months. So you might be getting a phone call. So come on, come on know. over. You're welcome. Right. To very, very good. Well, everybody, thank you for tuning into another episode of the podcast. As always, if you are interested in an old car, check out the Hemings Classified section. We've got like 25,000 cars online. Check out the auctions. Let us help you find whatever dream car that you want. Who knows? Maybe we'll even rope Dylan in. He could help you get it running. I'm totally speaking out of turn here because he might be like, Mike, shut up. I don't want to do that. But <laughs> <laughs> I'll offer up my services. So, again, dude, thanks for coming on, and we will talk to everybody soon. Thanks for listening, folks. And, again, please subscribe to the Hot Rod Barbecue podcast. If you're on Spotify, check us out there. Subscribe to it on iTunes. And if you are going to go to YouTube, make sure you go to the Hot Rod Barbecue podcast. And uh, hit that subscribe button and we'll come to you every week.